In this segment, I want to deal with Satan and demons. Who are they? Where do they come from? And what do they do? So, Satanas, or the Hebrew for Satan, means adversary or opponent. It uh, carried over into the New Testament Greek as Diabolos, or as we know it, as devil, which means primarily slanderer. And as I understand it, the Bible has at least 22 different names for Satan, our enemy. Right. Again, how does Satan and demons come about, and how do we how do we deal with them? It's a lot to bite off. See how much we get done tonight. So, who are they again? Where do they come from, and what do they do? Yeah, I really shouldn't have to say this. But I need to. The Bible alone, the Bible alone is our all sufficient and only inspired source of information regarding these beings. In this entire series on systematic theology, and this is probably about number 37, we have looked to Scripture and Scripture alone for our information so we should not change tactics especially when it comes to beings who are um, invisible and supernatural so again our our all-sufficient and only inspired source of information about Satan and demons is God's Word Specifically, to use a book like First Enoch to, quote, fill in the gaps of our knowledge does two awful things at the same time. It implies that the Word of God is insufficient. And I would just remind you of 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, which definitely tells us that all scripture is sufficient uh, for all of our needs. And then using details from a non-canonical book, a non-inspired book, in this manner is adding to the Bible which is explicitly forbidden, it is condemned by our holy God who wrote his word, and a curse is leveled upon those who do add to God's word. Revelation 22, 18-19 Y'all, it's one thing to use a book like First Enoch to help us to understand the historical setting of the New Testament and the Second Temple and so on, but it's quite another thing to use First Enoch as a template through which the Bible is read and interpreted and in which specific details are being added to our knowledge base of Satan and demons, uh, their origin and their nature. There's, I don't care how strenuously you deny that you're adding to it, but if you are using First Son Enoch, then in practice you're adding to Scripture. And this is being done in increasing frequency. 
Details regarding Satan and demons from First Enoch are being added to the biblical narrative, and that is unspeakably prideful. It must stop now. If the Bible is silent, then we are to put our hands over our mouth and be humble and accept that silence. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. I read first, Enoch, and there's a good reason, very good reason that it's not included in the Bible. It's not inspired. By any means. First of all, it was after the time of the prophetic ministries, and it was before the time of the apostolic ministries. Okay. Wish I didn't have to say that, but I did. Now, how did the notion of a red dress character with a pitchfork who looks like he just left a Halloween party become an image of Satan? In medieval Christianity, um, they believe that Satan's main sin was pride. And so the image, this caricature, was actually intentionally meant to mock him as a means of defense. They knew that Satan didn't really look like that. Their intention, I thought it was kind of, I think it's kind of dumb, but they thought that it would wound his pride and insult him and repel him and he'd slink away. Unfortunately the next generation kept the imagery but they didn't keep the explanation and so from the Middle Ages to our day there was this popular image of Satan and red tights, a tail, and a pitchfork but that's a little history. Satan is demons. I'm, I'm giving you my understanding of them now. Satan and his demons are fallen angels. That's a classical view and I stick to it. Scripture tells us there that there are elect angels, 1 Timothy 5 21, just as there are elect humans. And if there are elect angels, then that implies there are non-elect angels. They um, and Satan and all the demons were, in a sense, still are angels of varying kinds and ranks, but they rebelled. But in a sense, they, they're all angels. So now, and this is what uh, some would call this simplistic, but I call it symmetry. Now there are two and only two kinds of supernatural beings who populate the supernatural realm. Good and bad angels. With many, many biblical nicknames, so to speak. Satan has a ton of nicknames and demons have many nicknames. But they are Satan and demons are both pure evil, utterly depraved. Um, it's a pretty young, sobering thought. Now, what happened? <clears throat> Where did they come from? Um, <clears throat> we know that we have Adam and Eve perfect in the garden, right? And we have a uh, Satan coming to tempt them because we're told clearly in um, Revelation and elsewhere that the serpent was, in fact, Satan. But we're told in Genesis 131 that God describes um, his entire creation as very good. He declares his benediction upon the entire or whole of his creation. And we can assume that that would include the spirit realm, 
So I cannot imagine God declaring his creation very good if there had already included a fall, fall <clears throat> excuse me, in the spiritual realm. <clears throat> so sometime between Genesis 1.31, in chapter 3 verse 1 and we don't know how long that was we do not know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before they ate of the tree some people make it sound like it was a beeline and I probably have used that term myself but we don't know sometime between Genesis 131 and chapter 3 verse 1 there was a spiritual rebellion in the angelic realm now one possibility that I have thought of myself I haven't read it anywhere but one possibility is that Lucifer was assigned to guard Adam and Eve and he hated the newly revealed plan God had given them in which he would be subordinate to Adam and Eve and his fall may have been essentially simultaneous with the human fall or slightly before it point being and I think at Jonathan Edwards states this is that what prompted the fall was pride but specifically finding out Lucifer found out that he was going to have to <clears throat> be a, um, <clears throat> a um, minister of sorts to a creature that was going to be higher on the uh, scale than he was and uh, that precipitated the fall <clears throat> now there's um, there are some indications or hints in the Old Testament as to what um, was going on in Satan's mind or the behind the the fall of of Lucifer and um, texts like Isaiah 14 and perhaps Ezekiel 28 might they may give us insights. There's debate about that, but I think it's worth reading. Um, Isaiah 14 anyway because I, I, I just can't see how this can apply to um, just a human being let me read it okay <clears throat> coming from Isaiah 14 um, when the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon how you are fallen from heaven <clears throat> o day star <clears throat> son of the dawn how you are cut down to the ground you who laid out the nations low you said in your heart i will ascend to heaven above the stars of god i will set my throne on high i will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down low to Sheol, to the pit. See, again, I just don't see that being um, just of the uh, king of the human king that's being talked about. Because there are times when the prophets often spoke more than they knew <clears throat> they may have had uh, under inspiration of the holy spirit what i call a double agenda and um, i have a hard time seeing as i said how this can uh, only apply to a human king plus we know that satan is the god of this world so he is the ultimate wicked force behind this human wicked nation under God's sovereignty of course but this is beneath all of uh, his and behind all of his pride and again perhaps 28 we have more hints of um, Satan's fall I don't know 
but in that um, Ezekiel, we see a guardian cherub in the garden. And as she says, the garden of Eden. <clears throat> and that would place Satan near the garden and that he was designed as a warrior. And um, that may explain a lot. But um, regardless, <clears throat> another question, and I think that it is really... Um, bothered people is how Satan who was sinless and had no external temptation could have sinned um, I don't know any theologian who can answer that it's it's just a mystery uh, all I know is that he did <laughs> okay I think that the classic teaching I just laid out about the fall uh, regarding Satan uh, and the demons uh, falling with him uh, is the truth, um, and it helps ex the fact that uh, that that there was um, a large number of the demons falling with them helps to explain all of the false religion so soon after the fall. Um, human corruption and depravity can explain a lot of it, but prior to the Genesis six incident, you have a lot of um, demon based religion um, so where they come from uh, it's just a indicator that uh, that they were demon the, the other angels fell with Satan I know guys like Dr. Heiser and others appeal to Genesis 6 1 through 4 as the fall of the angels however um, a man I deeply respect Dr. Wayne Grudem who wrote that uh, classic system systematic theology um, dr. Grudem spent several days studying the ancient Jewish literature on this text the sin in Genesis 6 he studied the Midrash Talmud um, Josephus Philo um, other ancient Jewish literature as well as the Apocrypha and that would include first Enoch and he found 18 places where this particular sin in Genesis 6 is discussed. Now listen to this. Nine thought that they were humans um, who the sons of God were in, this, in that sin. Nine of the 18 thought that they were humans. And the other nine thought that they were angels. And I mention that because when you read Dr. Heiser, you kind of get the impression that it was uh, in, during the Second Temple Jews. It seems to have been a uniform interpretation uh, regarding um, the uh, the sin of, that it was um, uh, angels, and uh, maybe I've misread them. I just read his his latest book, but. Anyway, uh, it's not true. There was a lot of a lot of debate. Not to mention the fact that there were numerous, and I mean numerous, other um, influences going on besides First Enoch uh, in the uh, Second Temple community. I have studied this text, and uh, the context is 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 the contrast of the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman as mentioned in uh, Genesis 3.15, leading up to the flood, with only four verses devoted to this episode, with no commentary by Moses about it. Plus, that text says that they married, and the Bible says angels don't marry. And in addition, I know, those of you who don't know me, but I've been involved in about 100 demonic cases and um, many of them included sexual assault, demonic sexual assault on women. So I know women are being sexually assaulted by demons, but I don't know of any incident in which um, pregnancy has resulted. And um, I'm speculating, but I'm guessing that one of the reasons is because it's kind of like a cross-species issue. 
um, human angels. It'd be sort of like a pig mating with a gorilla. You don't uh, DNA. It doesn't. You just don't get offspring. Um, anyway, um, what do Satan and demons do? Well, lots of things, but they destroy and they lie. It, you know, you think about why in the world would Cain kill his own brother? Why? This is brother. And the New Testament says that uh, he was of Satan and uh, he murdered. And that Satan was a murderer from the beginning as well as a liar. John 8 44. Demonic influence can lead to self destruction. Uh, and some of you know about that. Any addictive behavior can lead to self destruction. You start hearing voices to kill yourself um, and so on. In addition, Satan and his demons hate, and I mean hate, the truth. And he, um, and I'm sure he's not real pleased with uh, what I'm doing right now, exposing exposing his lies. Um, he hates the gospel in particular, and you know the first recorded words of Satan are, "Did God say?" And then he went on just to flat out contradict God and say, "You know, he's lying to you." He doesn't want you to eat of that because he knows you'll become like him. Um, Satan in the Old Testament, we see him. I'm trying to jump around here, but um, we do see Satan mentioned in the Old Testament in Job, uh, in First Chronicles, when he um, incites David to do a census. Um, but we don't see any... Um, exorcising of demons in the Old Testament, which is interesting, and we know that there had to be demonic activity. Um, but then Jesus comes along on the scene. He speaks a word, and the demons leave. And no wonder the people are marveling. Um, nothing like this had ever happened before. And Jesus said that his casting out of demons was a one of the main signs that the kingdom had arrived. Um, I've done a study, uh, an in-depth study of uh, demons, and they are not the spirits of the dead Nephilim. Uh, that's based on an unbiblical source. The Bible sees Satan as the prince of demons. The prince of demons which suggests an identity of nature, but just difference in rank. We see this in Matthew 9, 34, where it says, But the Pharisees said, He, as Jesus, cast out demons by the prince of demons. Okay, they're basically saying, Jesus cast out demons by the prince of demons, Satan being the prince of demons. So when you talk about most the most natural rendering is that when you're talking about the prince of a group, the prince is usually is a, a, a similar um, similar type being. It's just that he's um, a higher rank. And um, then you have Matthew twelve twenty four, where it says, "It's only by beusable the prince of demons that this man casts out demons." <clears throat> and again, um, Jesus um, picks up on that and says, well, you know, Satan's fighting against Satan, and then uh, that's civil war, and so it's going to lead to disaster. But the Prince of Demons suggests again that Satan is essentially uh, one with demons as far as their identity, and um, that would fall in line with the fact that he and they, the demons, are both fallen angels. It's just that he's the highest in the rank. We see in Matthew 25, that class, classic text on the Last Judgment, 
where you have the the sheep and the goats on the right and the left hand, <clears throat> and, and in the uh, positive you have um, God and His angels, but um, consigning to hell is the devil and his angels. Okay, and that's the devil's angels mentioned in Matthew 25 is synonymous with all the demonic and unclean spirits which had been mentioned before in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I think the reason why he uses devil's angels here is, is primarily for literary um, symmetry, devil's angels versus God's angels. Um, and but you know why would he introduce a whole new um, being being or entity when <clears throat> he's talking about human beings being sentenced to hell and through throughout the book of uh, Matthew you have one instance after another of unclean spirits and demons being cast out um, by Jesus so um, just as God is the Lord of hosts, Satan mimics the Lord in so many different ways. And so he sees himself as the Lord of his infer infernal army. So demons, and these are some of the synonyms I see. Um, demons, unclean spirits, devils, angels, elemental spirits, principalities and powers, cosmic powers, etc., they're all synonyms for fallen angels, which are subordinate to Satan, who, again, they're all angels who are fallen. So, again, what do they do? They kill and they lie. <clears throat> and um, uh, let's see here. I wanna... With the rise of the occult in the United States, um, it's a great concern of mine that we come to terms with the identity of Satan and his demons. This is not just a uh, teaching or debating point. Um, we need to know our enemy. Uh, we have, we are increasingly jettisoning the living God and becoming more and more fascinated with the paranormal and increasingly enamored with occult, demon-ridden teaching the, um, from the East and um, neo-Gnosticism. And the more that we move away from our Christian moorings and become postmodern, post-Christian, then the more demonic doors are being opened left and right, and our culture is becoming demonized, um, really. Uh, I think an important text as far as the strategy of Satan is 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, um, the prince of darkness. If he can disguise himself as his exact opposite, the angel of light, then he can, and his demonic followers, uh, can manifest as anything, and I mean anything. Satan is a smooth talker, suave, very plausible sounding. There's a beautiful side to evil, as, um, uh, what's her name? I forget. She wrote a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil. Um, and as I said, they can appear as anything. And in my um, in my work in the field of demonology, I've seen some pretty bizarre things, like a, a demon appearing as a, as a cat that 
would appear and disappear. And uh, the kind of signs and wonders they do, they're, they're not false. They're, they are real um, supernatural activities. And again, as we as our culture goes down the tube, um, the demonic activity is, is going to become more and more frequent. <clears throat> and uh, the deluding power of false teaching is frightening. Um, the it, to me is. Um, how paralyzed people can be as far as, first of all, they're already paralyzed in the deadness of their sin. Um, it takes a miraculous act of God to regenerate uh, somebody and um, bring new life to them so that they can breathe. But when you have the deluding influence of false teaching, uh, the most bizarre sounding um, teaching sounds to sounds to people to be you know very plausible, but the fact that Satan appears as angel of light and knows how to appear as anything, uh, these demons, Satan, they know which buttons to push to attract us. Um, I've encountered demons on uh, many occasions and um, I've had them communicate with me via text, phone calls and it's nasty business and I did want to read one text because it it brings together a lot of um, what we're saying about Satan um, this is uh, from Revelation now war rose in heaven Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. Okay, <clears throat> we know that the dragon is Satan, right? And it talks about Satan and his angels <coughs> fighting back. All right, that's parallel to Matthew 25. But he was defeated. And by the way, elsewhere, uh, a few chapters later, the same activity uh, is attributed to demons and unclean spirits as far as working closely with the false prophet and so forth. And according to the hypothesis that I hear going around, the, the lowly demons, if they're associated with um, just the dead spirits, so the Nephilim, um, Satan wouldn't give to them the high responsibility of of bringing about uh, the last battle and being involved with his his uh, false trinity, and um, that would be more for, as I understand, Heiser's uh, system is more for his uh, hierarchy of the um, um, the uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Anyway, the ones that are um, uh, designated for the uh, different countries okay anyway uh, anyway there was no longer any place for them in heaven and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan and listen to this the deceiver of the whole world that's astonishing and that the deceiver not just a deceiver but the deceiver of the whole world now we know, and I need to qualify that because uh, when we're talking about in the New Testament, Satan being the, the God of this world, it's God is the God of the whole world, but the world narrowly defined here is that part of the world that is opposed to God. Um, but the deceiver of the whole world um, the, we have to say with tears that the vast majority of people in the world um, are deceived and are rushing headlong into hell. And um, under God's absolute sovereign control, um, 
Satan is deceiving the whole world. Um, those who are in the world system. He was thrown down to earth and his angels, he and his angels were thrown down with him. All right. So his angels were thrown down with him. And so we do, we do battle with. And I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Um, o earth and sea, uh, woe to you. The devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. Frustrated rage. Frustrated rage. That is what Satan knows. His time is short. Um... The text, I think, to me, that's very revealing that um, touches on what I mentioned a few moments ago about people being um, paralyzed in unbelief is um, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, okay, it's, it's veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing. Okay, do you see the agenda and the work of Satan and his demons, what they do? The gospel, I must say, hate it because it's the only thing that can save people. They try to veil it any way they can. Again, he's called the guy of this world. He blinds people's minds to keep them from seeing the light. And this is beautiful, actually. Seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And that's what we need to pray for our loved ones and for those who are lost, is that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ to his image of God would shine through this paralyzing darkness. And Satan and his demons will do whatever they can to hinder the truth or our effective gospel witness. If you want to know how Satan is going to um, attack you, um, or me, uh, a big part of that is, is to try to hinder the winsomeness, the fruitfulness, and effectiveness of our um, presenta presenta presenting, excuse me, um, or witnessing uh, of the truth, and uh, our being gospel witnesses with our lives and with our words. And um, so he'll bring temptation, fear, pride, doubt, envy, confusion, um, you add to that list, uh, depression, um, you know what I'm talking about? I'm sure you do. Okay. <clears throat> um, can demons and Satan... Can they read our minds? Can they? Absolutely not. That is a prerogative of deity. Demons and Satans cannot read our minds. Um, well, Mark Hattie explained the fact that psychics and folks like them how how do they get this information about us that's because demons are very keen observers and they transmit information to the psychics um, think of the shows the psychic detectives whether they're witting or unwitting I don't know Ben Spun who, who it is but even if they do these psychic detectives help the um the psychics who help the detectives, even if they do help them to find whoever they're looking for, you can bet 
that there's a high price that's going to be paid by someone or someones. Uh, another thing we need to know about both Satan and demons is that they can only be at one place at one time. And um, they are they are strong, but they are far from omnipotent. They are fast, but uh, they are not omnipresent. Um, whoever, quoting a verse here now, it says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Um, I think what he's talking about there is going back to Genesis. But um, one of the verses I love is it says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. We need to highlight that in our thinking and our teaching. Is that one of the main reasons Christ died <clears throat> was to um, destroy Satan. So there were today Satan and demons. <clears throat> well, originally Christ gave his authority over demons to the 12, and then he gave it to the 70, and then it's to been given this authority over demons to the entire church, all of God's uh, blood bought children. <clears throat> we live in the time of Acts. We should see 2018 as an extension of the book of Acts. Um, and a crucial verse when it comes to spiritual warfare is um, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay. Um, uh, how about um, <clears throat> maybe somebody thinking about generational sin? There's different thoughts on that. <clears throat> and I, I know for sure that it can be overdone and it can be overdone, under and overdone, the notion of generational sin. Um, some folks, um, the way they talk is that it would seem that everybody has <clears throat> some kind of uh, demonic problem because um, the way they teach is as if you have any kind of um, serious problems in your ancestral tree, then it's going to come bouncing down on you. Well, all of us have. If you go back far enough, somebody's going to be doing something <coughs> they shouldn't have been doing, some kind of darkness. But the verse that comes to my mind is this, is it with yourself or with someone else? If you suspect that there are some generational issues going on, please remember this verse out of First um, Peter. It says, "Knowing that you were not, excuse me, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ." like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So if you're with someone, then you could <clears throat> talk to them about that and see what specifically, like if there was alcoholism for three or four generations, and um, if that person has, um, by God's grace, is, is broken it and uh, is struggling, is just... Um, you know, first pray that <clears throat> get their permission, um, and pray that uh, God would um, uh, that that God would um, because through the blood of Jesus and the uh, precious blood of Christ that um, uh, He would be ransomed from those futile ways of life that had been passed down to Him, and then rebuke any. Um, a uh, possible demon of uh, <clears throat> that is associated with that. Okay. 
And while I'm thinking about it, when we're with people and we suspect that in their house or with their persons that there might be some demonic activity, um, maybe a gentle way to bring it up is to say something like, um, have you ever suspected that there might be some kind of, um, uh, you know, dark spiritual influence going on, going on? You know, cause some people can get really weirded out real quick if you mention, hey, have you thought maybe this is uh, your house has uh, demons in it or uh, you, you have demonic problems? Um, just trying to be sensitive, you know, to people. And then, you know, often they'll say, you know, it's funny that you would mention that. I've been thinking for many years that uh, I might have some kind of a uh, problem with a demon. And then they bring it up. And you can normally say, well, hey, do you mind if I pray that uh, that we get rid of this um, this uh, demon that is uh, oppressing you? Um, which, uh, again, can... Uh, well, I'm thinking about it. Can Christians be uh, possessed? Absolutely not. However, however, um, depending upon how much we give, how, how much we um, leeway we give to the evil one, um, I have seen true Christians who were so frightfully oppressed that it almost looked like possession. <clears throat> almost. <clears throat> they didn't lose um, their will, but boy, it sure came, seemed close to it at times. Oh, it was frightening. And we need to remember that um, Ephesians uh, 4.26-27 is important in this regard. It says, Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no <clears throat> opportunity to the devil. <clears throat> and the word opportunity there uh, is a word, Greek word topos. And uh, it's variously translated as opportunity or foothold. <clears throat> and several other terms. But the basic opportunity um, is giving um, what some people call a, a legal right um, to uh, walk, to get put a, 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 a foot in the door, so to speak. And, you know, habitual sins, addiction things, um, it starts off with a foot in the door. And then it gets cracked in further, and then before you know it, the door is wide open, and uh, you've got a, a full-blown from infestation to um, uh, oppression going on. Um, so that's an important verse to remember. Things like anger, habitual anger, we may not think of that as being something that could bring on uh, uh, or be a door opener to the evil one, but Paul specifically um, mentions that, uh, highlights that as the, um, the doorway. And um, yeah, I think of how many spouses, as well as friends, you know, go to bed, literally go to bed angry. <clears throat> and then wake up <clears throat> and there's never any uh, attempt at reconciliation and um, habitual sin can lead to giving the devil a foothold um, you know there needs to be a balance um, I'm not sure how to say this to say it uh, scripture is very clear that we fight against the world, the flesh, which is what I call indwelling sin, and demons, spiritual warfare. You know, we're focusing on Satan and demons now. But I want us to keep 
uh, in light of a lot of the books that are coming out now, they're not biblical uh, in terms of the balance. They're biblical in terms of a lot of the insights that they give as far as getting rid of uh, uh, demonic presence and so forth. But um, in speaking to many folks, you would think that you know the main issue that we have is is with demonic. Uh, but if you read the Book of Acts and the Epistles, the usual approach that Paul and others had in dealing with problems was with sin and with disobedience and with calling people back to obedience. For example, in Corinth, which had more problems than you could shake a stick at, I don't recall him ever saying to the Corinthians, and I think about some of the issues they had. First, they had like pride. I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, and so on. You had the envy issue, then you had incest, then you had the problem with litigation, going to court with each other. But he never told them, cast out the pride, the demon of pride, and cast out the demon of envy. Never he told them to cast out the envy, uh, demon of incest with this man. Never told them to cast out the demon of litigation that was going on. What he did tell them was to use proper church discipline, uh, in that one instance anyway, for sure, but to deal with it as human sin and um, repent. Um, yes, sin, uh, habitual sin can lead to the opening of uh, doors to the demonic. Um, there's an interplay between all three of them, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, it's not an either or, but again, I'm just trying to bring balance and um, to see that if we, if we just hypothetically were a demonless and satanless world, we would still have a horrendous issue problem. Why? Because of my heart and your heart, which I'm just about to delve into, human sinfulness. That's frightening. <laughs> human heart the way Jesus talks about it okay now let me uh, deal with another question <clears throat> should Christians speak directly to a demon or pray to uh, pray to God uh, some some people are um, naturally um, hesitant to address uh, a demon and I can understand why I, I'm sure I was first time but um, I can tell you from personal experience that I remember one time a person praying several times for God to free them of a, and they clearly had a demonic issue, uh, which was causing empirical activity in their home, uh, observable stuff. And uh, <clears throat> so they prayed to the Father to get rid of the demons. Nothing happened. <clears throat> so I suggested um, instead of praying to God, uh, I think the biblical pattern is that Jesus and Paul and the rest address the demons uh, directly. Tell it to get out of there. And you don't need to go. And I think some folks have these uh, uh, you know, really long lists of stuff. They, they it's, I think to me, it's just simple. It's in the name of Jesus and Nazareth, um, get out of here and stay out. Okay. Um, so, in situations in, wh in which you are dealing with demons, um, you don't pray to God. You tell the demon to leave. And, <clears throat> you know, if you have a child that's having... Um, night terrors or something like that. Um, certainly we want to pray for our children every night, but <clears throat> I would suggest um, this is pretty common. So if that, if that doesn't help praying for your child, then um, uh, either with them, uh, um, 
you could try, you know, um, not in their presence if you're f f concerned about frightening them, <clears throat> commanding the demon to leave. But then, um, you, you know, it may come down to actually putting your hand on your son or child and saying, in the name of Jesus, um, I command you to leave. Okay. So, yeah, the New Testament pattern is uh, speaking directly to the demon, telling it, but not having a conversation with it um, and, and trying to get information. Don't do that. Okay. I, uh, I think I'm about done here. Um, we are... Oh, I want to say this. Folks who are dealing with demonic oppression are very often very open to the gospel. Um, I'm, I don't consider, I, I, I know I don't have the gift of evangelism, but I've had the privilege of leading um, the number of people to Christ because, boy, there's nothing like uh, direct demonic activity to scare people um, out of their wits. And when they see... <laughs> see with their eyes the power of Jesus, um, it has uh, an effect. And uh, so I would, um, and I, I saw that happen, you know, numerous times. Um, uh, there was uh, where folks would um, see uh, <clears throat> their home would, would just be so infested and with terrible activity and then I would go through the house and pray through each room and <clears throat> things would be cleared up and they'd be so grateful and um, you know I'd talk to them about the gospel and they would bow before the Lord but I have to also say that um it's very affirming to me as well. Um, at times it can be quite hairy and scary be, to, you know, to walk into a house that uh, can be, um, has real hateful, strong activity going on. But that's when you just cling white knuckle to the cross. And um, there's really nothing like seeing, seeing with my own eyes the name of Jesus um, being victorious over pure evil. Um, not because of anything I said, but because of my union with Christ. If it was just, you take the weakest demon um, and he could thrash me about like I was um, a wet noodle. But in Christ, by virtue of my union with Christ, um, I can stare down Satan and be a more than conqueror in Christ Jesus. Because in Colossians 2.15, he has disarmed the principalities and powers and made us all more than conquerors over both Satan and demons. Let's pray, shall we? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you that this is so much more than just a, another teaching uh, point and uh, even less a debating point. It's a beautiful truth that you have conquered the evil one and that we can live in victory. We know that the battle has been won but that we be engaged in spiritual warfare until we die or you come back. So help us, we pray, to grow in our understanding and in our effectiveness as far as speaking the truth uh, to a lost and broken world. In Jesus' name, amen.